So uh, let's start uh, this uh, session with um, the first uh, keynote uh, speaker of the day, uh, Simian Koopman. So uh, Simian is a professor of the Free University of uh, Amsterdam and is a world, one of the world leading uh, econometricians in the world, specialized in the field of uh, time series and, and, and forecasting. Okay, thank you very much. And also, thank you for having me here uh, at the ECB. I've been here um, for many years, and it's always a pleasure to come back. Um, my presentation is about uh, panel models, dynamic panel models, in the sense that, that I include uh, stochastic, dynamic stochastic uh, components into the panel model. Um, it is uh, joint work with a team from, uh, from the VU in Amsterdam, so my colleagues over there, but also people from Maastricht and from Lies. So we are sort of building some uh, nice work around the idea of uh, how to apply panel models in financial econometrics, in, uh, uh, in climate econometrics, so we have all kinds of nice applications, and I will show you um, uh, two, two of these uh, applications. So uh, dynamic panel data structure, you probably are familiar with the general setup, and I will not sort of move away very much from this uh, general setup. So, uh, so I think I can all, uh, we, we, we can all keep it relatively basic. Also the methods that I'm going to use are just regression and maximum likelihood. So, uh, so it is uh, in that sense, all very applied uh, material. Um, but the only sort of thing that I'm going to change is that inclusion of that lag dependent variable in the dynamic panel data model. So in the, in the middle of the, of the, of, of the slides, you can see the um, standard dynamic panel data model with a lag dependent variable in, with lambda as the uh, autoregressive auto coefficient. And that part I'm going to take away. So I'm going to take that one out and I'm going to replace that with a component, with a stochastic dynamic evolving component, and then still sort of address the dynamics in the panel, but then uh, not directly by including this lag dependent variable, but by having a dynamic component in. Well, in a two-way fixed model, um, uh, fixed effects model, where you both have fixed effect for the cross-section and for the time, and that is sort of at the bottom screen, you can see that, that is what we call a two-way effect uh, model, is that you have both a constant for the cross-sectional dimension, and you have the DT, the constant, for the time dimension. And that DT is not fixed in sort of my case, but I will allow that to be some stochastic variable, a time varying coefficient. So that is sort of uh, the idea. So although you can do sort of both by having the lag dependent variable in and having the DT in, but basically I'm going to remove both of them and replace them by this sort of stochastic uh, process. And, um, and that sort of allows me to um, to leave the sort of standard approach of GMM for the estimation of dynamic panel data models. So I'm going to use maximum likelihood estimation instead. And I'm sort of following that approach from the book of uh, Passerand in chapters 26 and 27, many, many more chapters to go there, but still these two chapters, they, uh, they, they, they talk about this sort of alternative of using uh, maximum likelihood for estimating uh, panel data models and dynamic panel data models. And well, that sort of uh, triggered me to look at this more carefully, to see that there are sort of also in the panel data world other ways of uh, estimating these type of models. So I'm going to use what uh, he also calls the uh, transformed maximum likelihood. So you're transforming the data, and then you can sort of rely on standard reg regression type uh, methods. So that is sort of the, the, the aim or the approach that I'm going to take uh, this, uh, this morning. I will start with the basic uh, panel regression model, and there you already see that I have replaced a dt by a mu t at the bottom. So that mu t is that uh, dynamic uh, variable, and uh, ci is still that fixed coefficient for the cross-sectional fixed effects uh, thing. So that, uh, that these two are both there. And then the focus is really on the estimation of the beta in, uh, with the regression part. And here, although in most of the examples that I'm going to take, XIT will just be a scalar, but I, as you can imagine, uh, you can easily generalize that to a vector of XIT where beta is and a row vector and XT is and column vector. So you can sort of do all these things, but in, in sort of like uh, uh, keep things a bit simple. I just take only one XT and then uh, show you how we're going to estimate the beta from there. 
Yeah, so all the lag dependent variables are now removed and all the dynamics are put in this um, UT. And that mu-t is then, it needs to be modeled explicitly. And that can be an AR um, a process. It's just basically alluding a bit to that sort of lag-dependent variable that you put in the dynamic panel data model. Well, instead, I have this mu-t, and I allow this mu-t to have an AR1 process. So still, the autoregressive dynamics are a part of the model, but not sort of directly, but more implicitly by having this uh, uh, unobserved component in. So that is basically the stochastic trend. And, well, once you start doing that, you can generalize this to an AR1 or to a random walk or to any other type of uh, dynamic process. You can include seasonalities in this way. You can include other types of uh, business cycle di dynamics if needed. So it can basically be fairly flexible. But again, I will only restrict myself a bit and so only basically focus on the muti and only have this as an AR1 or as a random walk process. Well, f f for many of us... Uh, an, an AR1 or a random walk, that is a huge uh, world of difference. Uh, one is stationary, one is non-stationary. But sort of in the methodology that I'm going to use, it, 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 it doesn't matter, really. So I can easily deal with um, a non-stationary component there or with multiple non-stationary components and, uh, and a mix of uh, non-stationary and stationary because in the end I'm going to use the Kalman filter to uh, sort of basically do the necessary transformation such that the prediction errors are all stationary and then from the prediction errors I get the likelihood function. And so in that sense, uh, that is uh, all covered. But yeah, that is all of the ID, and that is the definition of uh, mu t. So mu t is this uh, stochastic uh, process. Well, then, often it is sort of nicer to present a panel model in terms of regression type formulations, and that is what I'm doing here. So I'm going to write the same model as in the previous slide, where I have this mu t in, but I sort of, sort of hide this mu t in the error term. And so you can see I've now have an error term. Instead of epsilon t, I call it ut. And ut is basically the accumulation or the sum or the, the conglomerate of all the stochastic terms inside the model. Yeah, so on the right-hand side of the first equation, you see all the fixed coefficients, the ci and the and the beta, and the beta pooled in this uh, in this case here. And then the UIT has all the stochastic uh, terms in, and both the dynamic and the IID type of uh, dynamics. And so this is what I call the static formulation of the dynamic panel data model with stochastic trends. Well, and then basically many of the standard uh, panel data methods can be applied here between estimation, within estimation, differencing, that, that basically can all be done. Of course, you need to allow for the special UIT, for that special structure that you impose to uh, to the error term. And that can be dealt with uh, in, in a way that I will explain later during the presentation. So also in first differences, for example, if you want to do that, then you cannot, after first differencing, to remove the the, the fixed effects, the cross-sectional fixed effects, to remove them by taking a delta. You cannot then do straightforwardly a regression because you still need to allow for the autoregressive moving effort structure in the uh, delta ut. So even if ut is an ARMA or an ARIMA process, then delta ut is still an ARIMA or an ARMA process. So you still need to deal with that. So it is not that uh, after this you can solve to straightforward uh, least squares. You still need to solve allow for the dynamic in delta ut. But I will come back to that and at what stage I can uh, use the between and within estimation uh, depending on the assumptions that I can give to xit. So if xit is uncorrelated with the error, then I can do a, a random effects model. And if there are correlated, then I do a fixed effects models. But that doesn't change these, these techniques that uh, can still be applied. But then, of course, allowing for the ARMA errors in the regressor. Yeah, so as I said, this is very much uh, an, uh, what, what, what Pesteron calls the uh, transformed maximum likelihood method. It has been developed earlier, earlier than in his book. So he refers to all these papers where he sort of have, have, have developed this, uh, this type of method. So in the cross-sectional literature, this transformation approach is, uh, is, 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 is developed. Also in the time series literature, Harvey and Marshall, and Marshall 
Um, based in his uh, PhD thesis of Pablo Marshall, he also had all these dynamic uh, panel data models where he also uses uh, techniques like uh, the Kelman filter to estimate the dynamics in there. So in that sense, it is all um, uh, basically refreshing that uh, material that is around in the literature. I will come back to, the, um, to, to more links to the literature later on. So our approach provides the estimates of the time variance effects mu t. So um, in most of these techniques, and also in the techniques of Pestro, and basically the mu t is either differenced out or integrated out. We we are sort of not interested in it, and that is sort of where where our path sort of uh, uh, changes to, that is where we depart from each other. Because I, I I still think that the mu t can be very interesting, and I will have my illustrations where I show that the mu t really has an uh, an intrinsic uh, interest. So I'm not going to sort of integrate out mu t's and to get rid of them. I really are interested in them and I'm going to estimate them. Uh, so I'm going to estimate the mu t from the DPD model. Okay, so this is the uh, sort of the um, model. You can also see it as a dynamic factor model. Uh, so there's a link between these di uh, DPD models and the factor models. For example, in this setting, I can uh, take out the regression part, the B, X, I, T, and then sort of what is left over is very much like a dynamic factor model. So that is the second equation here on, on the slide, just to show you the link, that I'm not sort of oblivious of, uh, of the link with the dynamic factor model. I fully realize that, but in sort of these dynamic panel data models, the focus is much more on the estimation on the regression part. And that's basically also where I'm focusing uh, today. And of course, I can then also put a loading in front of the mu t, and in some applications, also in dynamic panel data model, it is sort of advantageous to put a lambda i, a loading uh, coefficient in front of the, um, of, the, of the dynamic process. And so if you have a heterogeneous panel where the dynamics are sort of like, have different impact in different uh, parts of the cross-section, then it is, uh, it is definitely advisable to put a uh, gamma i a loading in front of the muti. But also for some uh, applications of uh, this homogeneous panel, then you basically can just uh, ignore the loadings and just impose the same trend on all of them. So, so, so I, I, I see the link and also the estimation, but here we are going to focus much more on that first equation where we are interested in estimating also the, uh, the regression part and basically how to deal with the regression that is, I think, the major development uh, in this uh, presentation. Um, so these bottom remarks are basically saying that I'm aware of uh, all these links with dynamic factor models and that we can also have multiple st stochastic trends and then uh, have them, but I'm not going to focus on that. That is all sort of made either implicit or explicit. Well, another extension is that instead of only having a dynamic process for the uh, intercept, I think you're saying that the intercept is varying over time. Also, the beta, the pooled beta, can also be sort of varying over time. They can, the, 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 the regression can have different impacts on different parts of the cross section. I can, for some defined groups, or I can even each individual uh, uh, cross sectional uh, series can, can, can have their own beta, uh, their own beta i. But also over time, the regression can change. So you have basically that same division between the two ways of allowing for the heterogeneity in the cross-section, but also over time. And that is all of what I include in that uh, regression uh, part. So we have the beta t and the bi in the same way as the intercept. So we sort of generalize that uh, for the two. And then the idea is to extract both the mu t and the beta, uh, beta t and still allow for the fixed effects like ci, bi, uh, et cetera and how to uh, disentangle these uh, two estimation uh, processes. Um, well, this then, uh, basically a dynamic panel model with time varying effects. It always depends a bit on where the dimensions lie. Is the dimension high in N or is the dimension high in T? Well, in macros nowadays, I think more or less N and T are of equal size. So in many applications, what I've see, seen so far. But you also have these, 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 these truly panel things with large n and small t. And in these methods, we try to tackle them all. Of course, the, 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 the inference and the, and, 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 and the theoretical impl implications can be different. But for the methodology, that doesn't need to change very, very much. So the estimation, the inference can, uh, can, can follow in the, in the same way. Well, if n is really huge, and it is sort of not feasible to estimate all the 
uh, all the coefficients over the cross-sectional dimension, so all the CIs and the BIs, and it's just basically too much, then you can enforce them, take that into the part of the stochastic thing, and then you basically say, well, the CI is a stochastic term with a certain mean, C, and a certain variance, sigma squared C. And the same for beta I. So if there are too many, then you just all pool them, but you pool them in a, in a sense where you also allow a distribution. So it goes into the stochastic part of the model. And again, the methodology can, uh, can handle such cases as I will show you in a moment. Yeah, so all these different approaches of random coefficients and fixed coefficients, they uh, uh, really uh, the same thing. Yeah, there's always some issues about uh, identification if you go two ways, both in cross-section and the time uh, series dimension. But that is more to do with initial conditions, that the initial value for the, the trend of the uh, in the intercept and the trend in the slope coefficient, they, they, they need to be yeah, set equal to each other, or you set one to zero and the other one you estimate. So there are always some sort of like nitty-gritty details of how to do the identification, but that is just a long way you sort of see how to uh, tackle that. Yep, so this is basically the, uh, the overall model that I'm trying to, uh, to, uh, to tackle today. A single explanatory variable just for out of convenience, just to, to make the notation too uh, complicated. So everything is a scalar, what you see on the right hand side, everything is a scalar for the moment, but as I said, you can uh, generalize these things. You can basically just represent this whole thing as a mul multiple regression model, so that's what I do in the middle. You can see the yt is xt delta plus ut, where xt now contains all the intercepts, all the ones for each uh, cross-section, and the xt's, that is diagonal thing to match them for each cross-sectional thing. And the delta has all the fixed coefficients, the c's and the uh, b's uh, in them to, uh, to tackle that uh, estimation. So, it is an, so delta can be potentially be a large uh, vector, and again, uh, we can uh, tackle that via regression or via within estimation or between estimation, that sort of techniques. And then UT, that has this sort of like at the bottom, this uh, structure where you collect all the stochastic terms in. And so the UT is common to all the UTs. UT is now a vector, by the way, that is this n by, uh, n by one vector. And the UT is a scalar, so that's why there's a fat one in front of it, uh, vector of ones of n dimension. XT beta, I think that should also have a big one in there. I guess, oh no, XT is also a vector, as you can see on the right hand side. XT is also like a column vector, so that is an uh, n by one column vector. And then you have the beta T to uh, st stochastic part of the regression coefficient. Here, the funny thing is, and I will uh, come back to that in a moment, but here, the funny thing is that both the XT has an impact on the location, on the regression part, but also on the second moment on the variance part. So XT, because XT has both a stochastic time varying thing in there and a fixed effect for the cross-sectional part. So uh, that's why I have XT both in the variance and in the, uh, in the location, in the mean. Yeah, so that is basically the next step to uh, sort of sort out what exactly this multiple regression model is. Well, on the outset, all very simple, but it is about the UT. Yeah, I've already showed you the, the, the composition of UT and then the covariance structure of UT. Well, if you stack them all, so if in the end, as, as you can see in the bottom line of this uh, slide, in the end you want to st stack them all, basically to allow you to do uh, GLS and generalize least squares. But then, then I need to know what this omega matrix is and what the structure is of that omega matrix. And that omega matrix is implied by the definition of UT. So, and the UT also has the dynamics in there. So it is not only the contemporaneous variance that I need to allow for, but also all the cross stuff uh, for different time points. So it is like what we call a topless matrix. And so it has all these bends where we have the, the lag dependent uh, properties of uh, UT. UT is an error, is an unobserved thing, so to say. So it is an error, I'm uh, fully aware of that. But I can sort of uh, work out what the covariance structure is, uh, given the definition of uh, UT in the previous slide here at the bottom. So given that structure, mu T has dynamic uh, properties. Xt's are exogenous or 
semi-exogenous, and epsilon T is stochastic and also has properties. Beta T has properties, dynamic properties. So I can sort of work out all the variances and covariances and all the covariances. I can all work them out from this specification. And that sort of makes this omega matrix. So um, it is sort of like an animal. If you really want to uh, work it out, it is, uh, it's like a big beast. Uh, so you don't want, really want to analytically sort of work out exactly what the composition is at, but you don't have to do that. Uh, so there's no need to do that. Uh, that is basically the, the next slide. But if I have that sort of bottom uh, equation, yeah, then I can relax. And then it's just, just G, GLS. If, I, if I'm aware of how that omega and how to tackle this omega, is then I can relax and it is GLS and I can basically use any package that is around that can do uh, GLS. Yeah. So it is basically this translation thing of separating out the fixed part, the stochastic part, and then working out the stochastic part there. Well, just to show that benefit, as soon as I have this sort of my dynamic panel data model in this formulation, then uh, typically what you need to do uh, to do GLS, you basically do a transformation thing. So you do a Goleski on that omega. I know an animal thing, so not nice. I don't want to see it, but in principle, I can do this Goleski decomposition. And once I have the Goleski decomposition, I transform the left-hand side and the right-hand side variables. And I call that small v. So at the second third of the page, the uh, final equation that v and capital V, these are basically defined as the transformed and the Goleski transformed data. And so the small v y is the transformed data on the left-hand side, the observations that you have. And I call that uh, vi after the Goleski uh, transformation. Then the same for the axis, because as you see on the first equation on the left, you can see that x is the first thing that you see at the right-hand side. Well, you also transform that one. So you basically pre-multiply the left and the right-hand side by this L inverse, and then you get this small v, capital V, and this LU, or L inverse U, which I call VU. And the nice thing about this VU thing is that that is IID. And that is multivariate, big vector, N times T, N capital N times capital T, big thing. But in the end, after that Kolesky transformation, it is just an IID variable. And that means after the transformation, I can just apply OLS. And so then I can just do OLS calculations. So now the trick is how to get that uh, transformation going. Well, that's basically uh, the Kelman filter that is doing that for you. So you don't need to know explicitly what that omega is. You just need to know this UT. You see that error thing, the second equation? If I know the UT, if you give me that equation, then I can put that into state space form, and then I can ask the Kelman filter to do the Goleski decomposition for you. So basically I run like for every column on the left-hand side and every column in X, I run the Kelman filter to do that transformation and get my transformed data and my transformed X and then do OLS. That is all of the implication of this uh, transformation. Yep, so I'm going to put this error term, that second equation, I'm going to put, to put that in uh, state space form. That is, uh, that is the idea. So that error expression here is represented in state space form. That is sort of the second equation in the middle. That is the state space form. It's a slightly uh, unusual notation for me. I, I call the transition matrix here capital A. I'm not sure why I did that, but, but I'm sure for a certain reason that I thought that, that A matrix should be used here. But here uh, it is uh, the A matrix. And uh, ZT is the time varying bits where you have all the explanatory variables and uh, intercept uh, ones and zeros. So that's really like a uh, time varying uh, ZT in there. And the alpha T only contains, so the state vector here is only two dimensional in this case, only for the time varying intercept, uh, the, the mu T, and the time varying regression coefficient, the beta T. So it's really a two by one vector in this case. So even though the dimension of N can be huge, in the end, or the time variation, the pooled thing, I only have a state vector of two by one. So that is very parsimonious. And so Kelmerfeld is like a very light exercise. I only need to integrate out two uh, elements out of the likelihood. So that is sort of uh, a nice uh, thing. We notice that um, uh, UT is, uh, can be a big uh, vector. Uh, N, N can be potentially large in, uh, in panel data. But uh, there are ways to, uh, to treat uh, that high-dimensional observation factor, which I also will come back later. But the nice thing, as I 
underlined just a minute ago, is that that state vector that has a small dimension that uh, allows us to do uh, fancy stuff. The T matrix is, uh, or oh, sorry, the A matrix, the capital A matrix, that is uh, time, uh, uh, time invariant. So that's a fixed matrix, that's usually the AR coefficient, or some, uh, if you have seasonal, some seasonal uh, type of uh, uh, dynamics, but that is all fixed. So it is not changing over time, that A matrix. And that is all of important for now. But it can be subject to some parameters, so it can be uh, so like, like a phi coefficient. You then still need to estimate the phi coefficient. So that psi vector, so you see that the A matrix depends on a psi vector, and also some of the variances, they may still be unknown. That is something I would need to estimate via maximum likelihood. So all the other stuff is done by regression, but some stuff I still need to do uh, by maximum likelihood. Question is that I already have shown you this transformation. Only here it is sort of in stacked form. So it is here now all like in um, uh, econometrics. No, not not 1.1, but maybe 1.2, where we put everything into big vectors and then just do uh, more or less in, uh, in in multiple form. So that's sort of what we do here. So we basically apply more or less on that bottom equation. And so bottom equation there. And overall the dimension, and this L inverse, that is basically the Kelman filter operation. And it is doing column by column. So for every column of X, you will do this transformation. But you only need to do it for the mean. And so for those of you who are familiar with the Kelman filter, you have a part for the mean and a part for the variance. So the first equation is for the mean, and then the second equation is for the variance, and then the updating of the state is then for the mean, and all the other stuff is then for the variance. Well, here you only need to uh, do this for the mean. So you don't have to do this, uh, this this variance part of the Kelman filter. So it is really very, 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 very fast, this uh, L inverse. Okay, so then uh, once I have this uh, GLS done, basically I've integrated out all these fixed effects from the likelihood. Then the only part that remains is the dynamics, and that is inside the state vector, this two-dimensional state vector. And that is then what I do in the regular way via this Kelman filter operation and get the likelihood from the Kelman filter. So the Kelman filter is used in that sense fairly efficiently, both for estimating all the regression coefficients and for calculating the likelihood function. And that, that likelihood function, yeah, then I need to optimize that likelihood function over one, two, three, four parameters maybe, depending on how evolved your dynamic formulation of your stochastic trend is and uh, depending on how many variances you need to estimate how, uh, what, what type of level of heteroscedasticity you have in the error terms. So if there are many variances there to estimate, then you also need to do that via this uh, maximum likelihood uh, procedure. But every time the likelihood is sort of doing this transformation approach and then computing the likelihood. Yeah, so the whole approach basically relies on very classical methods, the OLS and the Kelman filter for doing the transformation. Yeah, and then the maximum likelihood estimation for the remaining coefficients. So that's sort of the technical bits. Uh, it is very much alluding to the sort of the transformed likelihood uh, approach that I was already mentioning earlier. Only here the transformation is not done explicitly in the way that uh, uh, that you can do if you put the lag dependent variable inside the model. And then then you do the sort of the transformation as in Pesseron, but here the change is that we add these stochastic components and then you do the transformation via the Kelman filter. So that is basically only the sort of the technical um, uh, deviation from uh, the method of uh, Pesseron. But the, so the implementation is different. It relies on this Kelman filter, you see. Yes, yes, fine. And then the, the use of the Kelman filter is to transform the data, and that goes back also to ages, ages, and ages ago. So that is also like uh, pretty much uh, established. Well, then there are some uh, nice things that I at least like that I want to estimate also the time varying coefficients. So if I put this time varying thing in for the intercept and for the regression coefficients, yeah, then after all that work, let's let me see it how it looks like. Well, that that is what we call signal extraction, and that is done via the Kelman filter and then maybe the smoother if you want to get the full um, estimate. Uh, it allows for forecasting, uh, important for now. So here it also opens up sort of a way for panel data models also to do some forecasting. And um, yeah, and it is again, this sort of implementation of this transformation approach can be combined with 
within estimation, between estimation, a different type of uh, approach. So all these different approaches in uh, panel data models can be handled. Also, if you make the CI, that is sort of the, the third item that I that I would like to discuss here. Even if you make all the CIs and the BIs stochastic, then they go into the UT term, but then still we can uh, deal with that within the, the Kalman filter because it is just a part of the variance. Uh, and it comes back as a layer for all the Ts, but you just put that into this formulation of UT and then uh, and then you're done. So that can all be uh, can all be added, so to say. Well, it's a big however two, so that was however one and however two. Um, if N is really, really big, then uh, well, you can do filtering, updating, equation by equation. There are all the techniques in the in 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 the book where we describe if N, the the, the cross-sectional dimension, is very big, then you can do all kinds of uh, techniques to lower the dimension by collapsing the observation vector into the dimension of the state, and that is here, of course, very beneficial because the state has only a very small dimension, and N has potentially a high dimension. So if I can collapse the whole thing to a dimension of only two, then yeah, Kalman filter is also very fast in this dimension of two. So there are all kinds of like uh, funny ways to uh, to make this really uh, uh, computationally efficient. But again, that is all building up uh, on uh, earlier work that uh, that is done earlier. Yeah, so this is basically the whole model that I've been uh, trying to tackle in this uh, presentation. I've sort of given you my uh, my journey of uh, how how I've uh, have arrived here. But um, but that is uh, what it is. Um, the um, the uh, identification issue is here at the bottom, and that is also what I do uh, for the two applications. Well, given the um, amount of time that I have, I'm only going to do, well, the most relevant thing here uh, within the buildings of the ECB, that is the Phillips curve. So I will present to you the uh, application of the Phillips curve, uh, work that I do uh, jointly with uh, Marent uh, Flecker from the Netherlands uh, Institute for Economic Policy in The Hague. And the other nice uh, illustration, I will probably not have time, and I will fly through all the pictures, but that is maybe not so useful. But um, that will also come out uh, soon. We are working now on the papers. and uh, yeah, fair, uh, yeah, fun. So that is a climate econometrics uh, application. So the Phillips curve uh, is like also a long history of uh, traditions of literature, but we are just focused on a very recent article by Hazel et al. in the QGAE. Uh, very re recent, and uh, they basically had this uh, basic uh, Phillips curve regression that they put put up uh, and estimating it, and were also discussing all the issues related to estimating the Phillips curve, the identification problem due to the co-varying between UT and the uh, and the uh, expected uh, inflation uh, term in there. Uh, so we have learned something from the Mavrudis uh, paper. And the issue of the simultaneity, the, the classical issue about supply and demand shocks and how to tackle these. We also have followed their solution in by instead of uh, looking at the accumulation of the inflation numbers uh, of the whole of the US, but looking at uh, state by state. So we're basically using this uh, illustration uh, because they have a panel of the, well, not all the 52 states, but uh, the 36 states. So they, they have a data base of 36 uh, states of the US and basically collected all the relevant variables for the Phillips curve equation. So uh, inflation, unemployment, uh, level of uh, uh, inflation, etc. So, so we uh, basically took their data and then uh, applied our uh, panel model on their, on their data. So here's the data. So this is the quarterly inflation by U.S. states, and as you know, there are many states, and you, uh, well, they, they only take it. You can see here that sometimes you have the complication that the data set is not balanced, so there are some missing values, and that, again, is, is music to my ears, because then again, you can say, well, the Kelmer filter can deal with all these missing, so we can basically run this all this data stuff with this uh, big gap in there, and if you then go back to Hazel, they, they, they do all kinds of imputation methods, and then say, like, oh, how ugly, and so we can just do this all uh, uh, much, uh, much nicer, of course. Would not expect something different from me, I guess. This is the unemployment data, that is balanced data. So this is the, uh, for each of the states. So it's the same picture, but now in all one color. But, uh, but it is the same uh, collection of data with all the 
states. You see some uh, variation in there, so you can uh, see. Uh, Oh, by the way, why does it solve that um, uh, supply and demand sort of simultaneous problem here? Here, the idea is that the um, that the uh, central banks cannot offset the regional demand shocks using a single uh, interest rate. So this may also be relevant for uh, for the European Union and for the for, for uh, you, you can set a policy for interest rate, but that still does not sort of impose on a full. Uh, demand shocks uh, regulations by the central bank. So that is basically why they motivated to use these uh, regional data set. Okay, so, the, um, so we basically took our uh, panel data model uh, from them, but they also had this sort of two ways effects with both the cross-sectional and the time varying thing. And so we basically took that uh, second dynamic panel data model with two time varying effects, both for the mu t and for the beta t. For the regression coefficient, that is not in uh, Hazel et al. So we, uh, uh, the introduction that we do in Hazel et al. That we also allow to have a time-varying Phillips uh, curve uh, coefficient. So the slope of the Phillips curve it can be time-varying. And so that's what you do in the same way as the intercept. And we use the lag uh, x in here because that is for unemployment, and uh, that's also what they do as an output measure. So this is the empirical model of uh, Hazel that uh, that was used, uh, well, lagged, but this was quarterly data, so they used uh, yearly lags, so T minus four, both for the price uh, level and for the um, uh, unemployment rate. Again, for all the states, so also for the relatively price variable is also state by state, so all these X's are state by state. So here you can see that we can deal also with this model, with multiple experimental variables. So, and then our model is, well, we allow a time varying coefficient for the Phillips curve slope, but not for the uh, level of uh, price. So we are not going to do this uh, thing. Yeah, so it fits uh, rather well. So Hazel is looking at model one, two, and three specification, and we add basically, uh, no, sorry. Hazel is looking at models one and two, and we basically add model three and four in their tables. So they have this table with all the GMM estimation results, and we now add, uh, well, the maximum likelihood estimation approach and allow for this uh, time varying uh, coefficient. So model three, model three, yeah, three minutes, now it's fine, I can, I, I can manage, because model three is only a time varying intercept, and model four is a time varying intercept and a time varying uh, slope for the Phillips curve. So, well, if you've, well, many of you, but if you look at the paper of uh, Hazel, they have this table here, and uh, well, they have even some more uh, options uh, before, but the last two columns are my first two columns here. Uh, these are maximum likelihood estimates, but they coincide pretty well with the GMM uh, estimation results of uh, Hazel, what is reported in that paper. And then we sort of add the stochastic trend and in model four, also the stochastic slope. And then it's sort of nice to see, of course, it's not very surprising that the likelihood is uh, is giving a big boost if you make that thing time varying, the time varying intercept, uh, making it sort of dynamic, uh, allowing also that uh, recognizing the dynamic features not only by a lag dependent variable but also by having a proper uh, stochastic formulation for uh, the dynamics over time. And if you also do that for the slope, that also adds uh, likelihood points. Uh, Tremendously. So I'm going to claim that the Phillips curve is not constant over time, over this uh, period of time. So it is really time varying. There are periods where the Phillips curve is very strong pr uh, present, and there are times where it is fairly weak. And that is sort of like summarized in uh, in this plot. So this is again model one, two, three, four. Uh, the bottom ones have the time varying coefficients for the mu t, but you only see the beta t. So that's why you see all these flat lines. So the slope for the first three models are just constant, but in the last model it is time varying, and there you can see it is uh, moving over time. Where you see periods where Phillips curve are really strong between the 1990s and the 2010, it is really significantly negative. But then in other times it is sort of like uh, somewhat weaker, then becomes negative again after the financial crisis, and now it is well, it is now maybe hard to say what the, uh, the thing is at the moment. But uh, time will tell. But you see that it is not constant over time. And uh, if you are not sort of uh, thinking that these confidence bounds will support that, then at least the uh, the table and the likelihood values, it's just a better fit of the data. 
with this uh, parsimonious model. Well, I don't have time for the instrumental variable because, uh, as I said, you have the issues of uh, simultaneity between the unemployment and the uh, price. Well, uh, in Hazel et al., they, make, uh, they do instrumental variable estimation using the Bartik um, uh, correction, and basically we follow that up. We did this sort of in their ways by just taking the fixed model and then sort of uh, in, the, in the second round to use the Y hats and the X hats from their model as it is explained here at the bottom of this slide. But we also did it for the time varying thing, and that even works uh, a bit better. But, but yeah, that is another step that I think people find hard to see how you can sort of uh, use an instrument in a time varying uh, coefficient context. So I, I think I will bear that to rest for the moment and just do the uh, standard procedures as they do it, and then maybe later think a bit more about uh, how to use um, uh, instrument variables in a dynamic uh, uh, time varying coefficient world. There, there are some papers about it. I uh, once, once you start reading and getting interested in it. There's some literature on this, so, uh, so I'm going to follow on that. But that's uh, for next time, not for today. And then you can add some list all of the instrumental variables. This is my last half a minute. Uh, and you can see again that, that all the time variation that you put in that is really supported by the data. And of course, the data is a very narrow jacket. It is like, like a, the, 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 the panel model is, is, is very parsimonious. And you put all the 36 states into that narrow jacket. So that is a, a big constraint. So if you just allow it to be a bit more flexible over time, at least, that, that, that the cross-sectional fit is, may change a bit over time. Yeah, that is, that's what the data likes a lot, the, to have that sort of flexibility. And that is sort of what you see in this, uh, in this overview, in this uh, and also with the instrument of variables. The, uh, the impact remains more or less the same, of course, are subtle differences in the... So the, the, the above pictures are without the instrument of variables and the lower pictures are with the instrument of variables. And they change a bit, but overall you can see, still see the significance of it. Well, that are the concluding remarks on inflation, basically uh, commenting on the things that are already mentioned to you. And it is uh, sort of a nice application of all the sort of methodological stuff that I've presented to you uh, earlier. So this is a straight um, um, application of that uh, material. Thanks a lot, Simian. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you could present yourself and give your institution for people online. So, Gabriel. Hi. Hello. This is Gabriel Perez Quiroz from the Bank of Spain. Uh, Simjan, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is kind of technical. When you have this, uh, I mean, a stochastic trend that contains a unit root, I mean, we know that in, in the that we have all these problems, pile up problem, and things like that. We had to go to the median and bias estimator and things like that. I don't know if you, I mean, you have you face this problem here, or this is completely. I don't know. Uh, that's something that I would like you to to mention. And the second thing is like, you present these nice results on different beta, I mean, different uh, slopes in the Phillips curve. Um, if we had done this thing for the aggregate, I mean, suppose that we, it would be very different or do we learn a lot from using the different, I, I would like to see what is the gain of using this thing versus using the aggregate and see, I don't know if we gain standard errors, precise, I mean, I don't know, something like that, so, okay? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Davide Delemane from Bank of Italy. Hi, Simeon. I have a couple of uh, technical questions about the estimation. Uh, um, I didn't get if you do iterative uh, procedures because if you go from RLS to Kalman filter, uh, or if you do in one step, or if you need uh, to initialize the Kalman filter, then do LS and then uh, uh, back and forth by iterated it. And then the second question if uh, have you thought about uh, to put uh, individual uh, new T, new IT, so individual trend? Because in this specification, you assume that all the cross section have a common trend. Uh, but uh, in many cases, maybe individual. Uh, CDS may have a different trend, or maybe they have a common trend but with the loading. And also the example with inflation may think maybe you may lose something because different states or different uh, countries in Europe may have different trend. And uh, so this may reduce al also the confidence band around your beta T, which are pretty big, and uh, floating around zero. 
So, and if you integrate out also the parameter uncertainty, I guess is, uh, it becomes, so probably giving a different dynamic specification of the mu t uh, may help. Thank you. So maybe, maybe I can add uh, one quick question also. So you mentioned at the beginning that uh, we could also imagine to deal with seasonal time series. Mm. So that could be super, super useful at some occasions. So, but I was wondering if you put a sees one seasonal for all, one common seasonality for all variables in the mu-t, or you could also imagine to have uh, seasonality for each variable in the, in the C high. Mm. Okay, so I don't know how to do that. And maybe also you didn't mention uh, forecasting. But uh, well, could you, mention you mentioned it, but uh, <laughs> could you, could you mentioned it, Ed, but uh, you did not exploit. Could you imagine to, to improve the forecast by looking at uh, disaggregated uh, variable by states? Yeah. Okay. I think I can still remember all the questions by head. So, uh, no, um, to uh, the, the non station, of course, uh, when, once you, when you do it directly, by having the lag dependent variable and then all these issues arise. But here you just impose a so conditioning. If, if you put a unit root on the stochastic component and all the variables ob ob obey to this sort of like common uh, uh, non-stationary random walk type of behavior, then there's no issue. But that is all about testing. So I'm going to look at the prediction errors. And if there's still sort of uh, like unit root uh, uh, evidence in the prediction errors, then of course I, I need to work on the model. Then I cannot do the like to then it is not valid anymore. But as soon as the prediction errors are all stationary and are then then, then basically I have uh, transformed the data into stationarity and then all my inference is uh, valid. So that is all the it is a bit more work. And you can also do it formally with testing, but usually what I do is just looking at the prediction errors and see if the and then uh, instead of just uh, uh, looking at all the individual and, and modeling and then sort of within the models, you, you pull everything into one component or just not taking all the averages. Well, if it is only like an, a trend, yeah, then, then, then I agree. Uh, yeah, sometimes you see these applications where they basically only just take the average. And then, but in these models where you have access, so you still want to sort of allow for the heterogeneity between all these axes. And you may have different components, one for the stationary and one for the non-stationary bits. Yeah, then, 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 then you don't want to sort of assume that all the series have the same type of decomposition. Then you sort of want to have different loadings on them. Uh, some of them can be common, other ones can be more idiosyncratic. So that, that sort of choice is then this is sort of beneficial. But if it is only like a straightforward application with one common trend or so, then yeah, then I think you can average the data. And then, uh, uh, then on the technical things about uh, the Kelman filtering, well, uh, once you know the hyperparameters, so once you know the autoregressive co coefficients and, and the variances, then the transformation um, is done. Well, if 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 if, if the component is non-stationary, then you need to do this diffuse initialization. If it's stationary, then you just have proper initialization, then there's no issue. And that filter is the same for each of the series that you have to transform. So for the Y and for each column of X. So then the whole initialization business is the same. So that is the prim primary use of the Kelman filter, just to do that transformation. Then if I have unknown coefficients that I need to estimate by maximum likelihood, then I also construct the likelihood from that model. Basically, it's just the OLS model, I can construct the likelihood. And that OLS model formulation is then subject to the to the parameter vector. So if you have a highly persistent AR1 or a not so persistent AR1, and then I just do the maximum likelihood based on the transformed data, just like OLS. So it is a non-linear OLS in some sense. Um, and, and the, so it is not an EM or something. This is just a one thing. So it is not an expectation maximization type of thing. It is just uh, evaluating the likelihood functions for models like these in one go. And you get a likelihood and well, if there are no, yeah. yeah so it is no EM type of thing at all. Um, and then your other question, oh yeah, was about the uh, idiosyncratic part that you can also include um, UITs. Uh, yes, you can. For example, Andrew has this balanced growth type of models. And well, as you know, we can also put that in state space. And then, of course, the number of coefficients become larger. So then you either have to group uh, parameters together just to make it all feasible. Um, but you can then also do sort of like uh, conditioning on, like, like, let's say, the common thing. 
that you first filter out the common part and then sort of the remainder you can then also but that is a, a, a bit more on the ad hoc side and basically what i'm trying to do is is to look at applications where people are basically just interested like here in the uh, Phillips curve. It is not so much that I want to forecast for each U.S. state the next uh, inflation or the uh, thing. That is not what they want. They just want to use it for the policy. They they are interested in the cumulative, and so they want to know nationwide what uh, inflation is. And so then, yeah, then of course it is not a model for each individual, but it is a model for all. And so it is like an effort. And then then I think it is justifiable. Then I'm not so unhappy if some of the prediction errors do not look so nice. Then I think, well, for the purpose of by the user, then then I think it's fine. But if there are other purposes uh, in mind, then they need to do other things. And that is the same on the forecasting. I think these one these are not typically good forecasting models because you pull so much together that in the end, yeah, you're you're paying something. There's still dynamics in there that I'm not accounted for. So uh, then, then I would more look at the idiosyncratic ones and then also use the, 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 the thing. But if you want to do it, you can do it. So maybe if you're interested in inflation forecasting, well, then there's always a big debate. And I think also in central banks they, they, uh, that is discussed widely is whether you sort of like pool first and then do the analysis mm -hmm. or first do the analysis and then pull the results and then i think there are mixed messages in, in the literature some people say oh no you first pull all the data and then do the forecasting mm -hmm. or you first do the individual forecasting and mm -hmm. then you average the forecast that is that's a bit of a mixed bag mm -hmm. and then the seasonality yeah. well in that other application uh, uh, illustration i really have the seasonality in mm -hmm. so it is like summer winter it is like uh, Ethane measures and they are high in the summer and low in the winter, so you have to solve up and down, and that that can be included. Common. Yeah, that is then common again because otherwise it is just too much for yeah, uh, sure. 36 days. But again, you can do it, but then you need to do some ad hoc. I would not sort of uh, advocate to then have a state factor of uh, 36 times 12 uh, elements in the state and put them all in. Nowadays, computers are fast, but it's just not so elegant, so, so it is nicer just to think about other ways to do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.